The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. I don't think it's necessarily fear, but I think I'm just too much of a perfectionist and I am too detail oriented that it would take it would take real um, it would take real work to break my own like habits to like I, I, I don't I don't think I would allow myself like I, I like to be good at things right out of gate I think there's too much work involved in perfecting a craft like that but you're the person I've been talking about I yeah, mean it's not <laughs> what do you mean good Joe <laughs> you're the one <laughs> the, the, the fearful part yes. it's but it, but I also don't feel a calling to do it like I think that you like I never wanted to take an art class oh. like you know like it, it, it wouldn't feel like home yeah. like when you said you picked it up and it felt like home yeah. like I, I don't that's not I don't think that that would resonate I want to make her paint like we paint with well yeah exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're not the first artist to threaten yeah. this no you should sure. definitely try it <laughs> welcome everyone back to Plenary Easton Podcast my name is Tim Wagon I'm here with Jess Bellis what's going on guys Man, we had a really great conversation today with Jill Basham. Yeah, we really did. I mean, I uh, love Jill's work, and I love the fact that she's a, I think I said it in the podcast, that she's a local painter here. And, she, you know, she paints differently than, than a lot of people in, in, in Plan Air Easton does. And so I think um, if you're out there, uh, tune, stay tuned into this one because she offers some interesting insights. So. Yeah, I know. I was really inspired by her drive to do better and learn more man she kind of she almost makes me want to take an art class almost yeah and she even talks about flipping the painting upside down and trying it that way i mean I really jess you should take an art class but we'll, we'll be on that <laughs> i hope everybody enjoys the conversation yeah let's get with uh, this is jill basham uh planner eastern podcasts today we are here with uh very interesting uh, painter in, in my mind. Uh, she's a local painter. Um, and I think we're going to hear a little bit about her story and how uh, she turned from a housewife or... Uh, Are you a housewife? <laughs> uh, Never! Stay-at-home mom, I don't know, into a plein air painter. And I'm really glad that actually we, we got Jill Basham in here because I've always sort of heard that her story but never really got to know it. So I'm really curious today about how... how how this has all worked out for you. Jill, and it's so fun we get to have you in our studio. Yay! Yay! Well, thank you for having me. I'm honored. <laughs> Jill, did he just call you a housewife? He did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's, just how, that's just how little I know, knew about uh, Jill. The only thing I knew about Jill was her first year. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun. And Jess, you know you, you know the history of the, uh, of the festival in, in its entirety a little bit better than I do. But I knew that... You said when I met you the first year, I don't know, which was maybe nine, ten years ago, that you had never done this before. Um, and consequently, over the last ten years, you have been either winning awards or selling a lot of paintings. Yeah, she's like a plein air powerhouse <laughs> right. now. And I never really heard or never really fully understood when you said it, you had never done this before, what that actually meant, you know, um, how you became a planner. Go ahead. Yeah, Jess. so let's back it up, Jill. You've loved painting. You've loved art your whole life. True or false? True. That is true. Yes. And then what happened? So <clears throat> I basically went to school, um, took art classes in high school, middle school, and then from there I thought, you know, in college, boy, I, I can't. Not practical. Not practical. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the money? <laughs> <laughs> Where's that paycheck? Self-sustaining. <laughs> so I ended up uh, not going the, the art route. And um, Which route did you go? So I, I was a... Not the housewife. Oh, right. the money was really in sociology, though. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, and urban planning. Uh, so anyway, I, I went into urban planning. There's a lot of art in urban planning. There That's is a lot of drawing, art. Yeah, so a lot of drawing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and a lot yes. of design. Right, yes. But you have to be able to visualize. Yeah, yeah. But then I, my career sort of took a turn into uh, transportation planning. 
And that really was not up my alley. That was more technical, math-oriented stuff. So once our family started, I decided to step back from work and um, uh, took some time off. Uh, not really. Like Working a housewife. hard. Ra- not a house- <laughs> Raising kids. <laughs> I just want to be really clear that Tim has never been a housewife, nor has he raised <laughs> his children. So he has no idea what a tough job that is. Is, is a housewife still a term anymore? Is it even I, a term? I think that might be antiquated. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm getting. My husband is not the house. <laughs> <laughs> Household manager. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, once the fourth child um, got old enough that I thought, you know what, this is getting a little lighter for me. The load's a little lighter. I need to figure out, um, you know, what I really want to do because I knew I didn't want to go back to what I was doing previously. Uh, And I was a creative person and I knew I enjoyed art. Started taking drawing classes at the academy, the art academy in Easton. And, um, And then in 2000, and how familiar did that feel? Like you picked up the chalk pencil or the, like, tell me, what, like, how, what, what happened? It, it felt like I was coming home, you know? It felt like it was what I was, you know, supposed to be doing. <laughs> it, clicked, it clicked, it clicked right, right away. Yeah, yeah. yeah you wanted yeah. to just do more. Absolutely. It was, uh, I knew that this was, this was the path that I wanted. How scary was it to sign up for that first class? Or was it just kind of like a lark? Were you like, "Eh, I'm just going to go try this? Or were you like, oh my God, do I really want to go and start putting myself out there? Mm, It was a little scary. Yeah. Yeah. It was a little scary, but I knew that it was something that, um, that I might really enjoy. And, and I decided I had to push, push that, you know, the scary part aside and, and not be, uh, afraid, you know? So you started drawing, and how, how, how did that evolve to picking up a paintbrush? And um, how fast did that evolution happen? Yeah, so I started in about 2007, eight, taking drawing classes with Katie Cassidy mm-hmm. in, at the Academy. And, um, and then in 2009, um, started an oil painting class with Mary Eckrew um, in Cambridge. And... Um, as soon as, as soon as I put that you know the paintbrush to canvas, it was I just absolutely fell in love with oil painting. Had you ever painted with oils before? I mean, when you talk about high school and middle school and art, like not many people get oil painting exposure that young. Did you? I did not. Yeah. No, no. So really, it was the fir- when you were with Mary, it was the first time you had messed around in that medium. Absolutely, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and when you say awesome. you, when you say you fell you fell in love with uh, oil painting, what what do you mean exactly? Like you just what what happened to you? You were painting every second. You, what what happened to you? Well, I think there's something about the consistency of of oil paint that is appealing and. Um, it's it's in some ways more forgiving than other mediums. I mean, you can you can continue to work with it. You can scrape it. You can reapply paint. Um, and uh, there's just a lot of joy in it, I think. And uh, and I think the finished product can sh- has the potential to show that joy with the texture and the brush strokes. Right. I guess what I'm saying is you just you once you found that medium. Yeah. You were, you were you've been painting every day since. Is that is that what kind of happened? Well, I wouldn't say painting every day since, but it has been um, on the uptick as far as it got um, your brain moving got right my away. Brain moving, and now, pre- now, pretty much, I paint every day. Yes. Yeah. When you hit the oil, was there no going back to other mediums? I mean, going to drawing, and then, or, or did you no. did you play around and with some watercolors and take an acrylics class, or you know? Yes. Or, yeah. No, I d- definitely um, have tried other mediums, and I enjoy painting gouache mm. um, still. Um, Yes, I, yeah, I like other mediums, but oil, oil spoke really, to you yeah. loud, and and I think it's always a good idea to have a good, strong foundation in drawing. Um, so it's it's always good to go back. You hear to that, that, kids? <laughs> so I can't, I, we have our I have a, the Avalon has an after school art club, and we make them draw and draw and draw uh, and draw. Yes. They're like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> see, it's the drawing. <laughs> And that's kind of curious, uh, Jill. I, don't, I want to stick back, on, get back on plein air for a second too. But your drawings, I, I'm trying to. For anyone who knows Jill's paintings, and maybe you could be look Jill Basham. She's online. You can look up her stuff online if you want to listen. Look it up while you're listening to this podcast. How would you draw your paintings versus other plein air painters? They don't. To me, mm-hmm. 
I, I don't know how you would draw that. Right. Or I guess I'll start. I'll ask that maybe a little bit differently too. Do you start with a sketch? Were you starting with sketching? Like, is that how you visualize things, or not really? Not really. No, I I am an impatient um, person. I I'm. I you put the paint on right away. I, 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 yes, I do. I think about design, and um, and I kind, I kind of just jump right in, um, hope, hoping for a solid design, initial design. But I do create that on the canvas itself initially. The a pencil drawing. No, no. He, she just With goes paint. for it. Okay. She yeah. goes for it. So, so how does <laughs> I guess then how does the drawing? Uh, come into the fact that you know you can draw leads you to put the paint on a certain way it's like practice right yeah, is it no, like practice it is and it becomes a, almost a, a muscle i say muscle memory but it's a matter of being able to look at a scene and really when i'm laying in that initial design i'm dr i'm drawing it in with the paintbrush gotcha. so it's the same it's the same principle as um, using a pencil uh, it's just with a paintbrush. But it's the practice of using that pencil over and over again and being able to take what, you, what you're seeing and translate it to a way that you like the way it looks on a piece of paper. Right? Does that make yes. sense? Yeah, that is, yeah. Yeah. Something like that, Tim. <laughs> I don't know. I sure as hell can't well, do it. <laughs> there, are other, there are other painters that you could look at their paintings and you could say, okay, well, that's a barn and and they could have drawn mm -hmm. that first or laid that yeah. out. After well, again, the, at the Planner Easton, you, you can see little practice sketches. Some of them have exactly. little sketchbooks where they have the whole thing mapped out before they even like crack open their paint box. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. well, see, I, I did not have an illustration background. That's and, a difference, too. Yeah. And also, you know, <clears throat> certain things interest me more than others. You know, I'm not particularly interested in necessarily the barn mm -hmm. or the details on a boat. Um, I am interested in in um, man-made objects, but I don't feel the need to describe each detail of them. I, I'd rather let the viewer have some sort of say into in deciding what it's looking like. Mm -hmm. I, I love I love what you're saying. It goes into something we were talking about yeah. earlier, but I want to just dial it back to, so you've started to paint in oil paints, and at what point were you saying to yourself, I might be really good at this? Or other people were saying to you, Jill, this is really impressive. You need to take the leap from creating artwork that is for you and your own satisfaction or gratification, education, mm -hmm. to starting to push it more out to other people. Like, is, is that something that happened? Is that how it happens? Yeah, it's, it was kind of a weird feeling, honestly. I, 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 um, I did get external feedback but it was almost an internal feeling that I knew that I had more capability, that I just needed to learn more. And Pushing yourself. And push myself and practice more. I mean, I did get the external feedback of getting some awards pretty early on, which was shocking to me. Um, but I, And the thing is, I was in my own um, mindset of um, painting for painting for myself and the joy of, that I was, I mean, I was just so joyful about about the experience of painting that I wasn't thinking about um, the competition, you know, and, and uh, the work of art. I was thinking about the joy that I was experiencing creating the It art. was filling you up. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there had to have been a moment where you said, okay, like, it was was the moment I'm going to push myself and compete? Like, was that your first sort of venture into public exhibition? Probably no. No, I uh, actually started applying to shows or like. Yeah, how did and, you get yourself and, out there? Um, uh, there is some a, a local gallery that's no longer in existence. Carla and Pete um, had a little gallery on a corner in Easton, and I. Uh, they asked for me to show there. I joined um, Working Artists Forum, um, started networking with some local artists, and then went to um, a different gallery in Easton. And um, So I don't want to put words in your yeah. mouth, but would you, if somebody has taken classes and they're feeling that joy and fulfilled, mm -hmm. is your advice to find groups to network with? Like, is that the next step? I do, I do think like, so. Is it the logical yes, next yes, step? Yes, yeah. Surround I mean, yourself with other artists. Surround yourself with other artists and find maybe an artist or two that you really admire and respect and connect with them and 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 I think artists are a very friendly group they're willing to help and um, reach out to them and say this is what I'm looking for what can I do and they can they can find uh, they can I, I'm sure help you out and find local opportunities for growth for you 
How long of a time period was that, Jill, where you took the art classes at the academy and then kind of made your your friends with the other, uh, you started, got, got displayed at Pete and uh, yeah. Carl's place. How long of a, two years, one year, six months? Um, let's see, it was probably about a year, yeah, that mm-hmm. I, yeah, from the time of, of actually starting to paint. To show. I just will say to everybody who's listening, that's not normal. <laughs> so <laughs> don't, if you've been taking classes for like 15 years or something and still don't want to show your stuff, that's totally, <laughs> that, that could be more average than uh, picking up the paintbrush for the first time and then making real connections. <laughs> that's very true. But I, I guess you, the other side is true, is the other side is you could say, and it could, but it also could be you if you're out there listening. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, but it goes both ways. Um, there's a lot of probability and statistics and all of it. Um, Jill, uh, was it serendipitous that Easton had a plein air competition? It was, yeah. I, I feel extremely fortunate to live locally and um, and be able to apply and honestly not expect to to get in and to get a response that I got in back in I think it was 2012 was the first year that I participated. We do live in a really awesome art community and there are a lot of a lot a lot of painters here. There's a lot of opportunities to take workshops and art classes. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that that makes us it's one of the many ways that Easton is different from if you if you live sort of in middle America somewhere and jo- and Jill's like, "Oh, find an arts community and like get yourself connected with them." Here that is a lot simpler than it a is. lot of other places. That is true. Um yeah. I mean, I guess Dave Grafton, who had an art gallery here, Nancy Tankers, who had an art gallery here. These were people who painted plein air and had galleries. And you have people like Sarah Lynn Polly, and there's and there's others who had been in the business a long time. You're just coming into the, the world of art, of the world of painting art. And there happens to be a very uh, well-renowned uh, painting competition right in your hometown. For somebody who had sold very few paintings coming out, you know, Versus all these other painters who have careers that you were competing against. Yes, yes. To yeah. not have to go to Milwaukee to try to build a collector's group or not have to go to California to find collectors. You were able to sort of pick up a brush, mm-hmm. say, I think I like this again, mm-hmm. and start a kind of major career right in your hometown yeah. of Easton. How, yeah. what is it? It was an incredible opportunity. I mean, I, I feel very fortunate to to live in this location and to have Plenary Easton right in my backyard. Literally, um, it's it's opened doors for me to yeah to have my work exposed at at the national level. Um, never in my wildest dreams would I expect to be doing what I'm doing now, and and fortunately where I am now, but. Uh, you know, I still feel like I have a lot of work ahead of me. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's something that like has resonated with me this whole conversation. And I, I spoke with Joel a little bit before we stepped into the studio. You do have like a, an enormous amount of, of drive or almost a calling to continue forward. That's like what's resonating with me. And, you know, you're saying that you're painting because it, it brings you joy. It's still bringing you joy and you're still growing, right? I, like I, Yes. And I uh, something about um, exploring other avenues or ways of applying paint is always pushing me forward because I think and I've heard this from other artists as well is that we will never know it all there's always something else to be learned with painting and um, the the more I I learn the harder the next painting can can be in, in a certain sense because I have certain expectations for myself and and I want to meet those expectations and exceed my expectations and talk to me about fear and when it has held you back and when you haven't been able to push it aside and it's led to success mm-hmm. yeah uh, f- fear I think is is something uh, that can stop a lot of artists in their tracks even to approach a painting even to begin a painting yeah I, uh, it can I feel daunting to look at that white canvas it and is. say oh my gosh where do, where do I go but um, I um, and I felt that and I've I've been paralyzed sometimes where I'm I'm concerned about um, maybe I'm in a competition I'm concerned about um, other artists and what they're doing um, what the judge will think about this particular work um, this isn't going to measure up this isn't lo- the style that um, 
that would suit this event, whatever. And um, it's a matter of, I think, just pushing that aside and uh, saying, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm not gonna worry about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint for myself. And, um, and sometimes those paintings can be the best paintings um, that you can do when you're, you're not worried about um, what others are thinking or how, how, what, the, what the end result might be. And it might be a failed painting. And How often and, do you wipe a painting out? Oh, very, I mean, I, I, uh, I think part, part of maybe my approach um, is that I have a higher frequency of painting wipeouts, but with those wipeouts, I often will flip the painting around and then restart. And uh, this is more in the studio type, and, and then I see other opportunities within the painting, you know, or, or it might take a different direction altogether. So. I actually painted with Jill one time. She actually painted on one of my paintings. And I can even say one of my paintings. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, what painting that I was painting on. And uh, she came up and she said she would help me. In the, and and uh, the last 15 minutes, she's like, just throw paint on. Throw it on. Throw, 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 <laughs> put it on. Put it on. Put it on. No, no, no. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Just keep doing it. And, and it, was, it was really, you know, sort of wild to, to be around uh, somebody who's and, – and, you know – that's the way she worked and and um it was reminded me a lot of, a lot of other arts just you know just kind of do it you know just lay it down just go ahead and go ahead and, versus being so right. scared to draw something yeah. on it you know or trying to get the right line exactly perfect there's something about that expression of that strong brushstroke when you're just laying it down that um as as a, someone looking to purchase art or a collector, they look for that. They look for the fact that you're brave enough to just put it down and not be afraid. Like just lay it in. Sure. Yeah, right. Right. Well, I remember the one yeah. judge who um, gave uh, the award to one of the kids in the in the in the quick draw one year, and um, you know there was one that was a beautiful painting. This mm -hmm. 13 or 14 year old ch child had done, and then another one that. A nine-year-old child had done, yeah. and he gave them, and it was just rather, you know, sort of, you know, rudimentary. Uh -huh. And um, I, he gave it first place, and, and versus the yeah. one that was a beautiful canopy. And I asked him why, and he said, "If you look at that painting, he said that kid never second guessed himself. There's no right. wipeouts. There's no right. second strokes. Every stroke that kid put on there was the, what Very they wanted purposeful. to do. It was just pretty yes. wild. That, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you ever get feedback that your work is not plein air? Like, have people said that to you or not really? No, I haven't really gotten it's not plein air. I've gotten that it's not traditional plein air, that it, it doesn't fit the traditional plein air mold. And I, you know, I think that I could paint within the traditional plein air mold boundaries. But it wouldn't bring you that joy that no, you're talking it about. It would be somebody else's work yeah, coming just, out of your hands. It's just not me. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's, and, and it's so great. To, that's what I love about these events, too, is, is seeing everyone's different take on the same view, even. I mean, Agreed. You can have artists lined up painting the same thing. and Have 50 totally different totally paintings. Totally different, yeah, and I love that. What would you call your style, Joe? You know, <laughs> Tim, put your, I, wait, put yourself in a box, Jill. What does yeah, it look like? That, <laughs> no artist uh, can do that. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. It's not abstract. Well, I was talking to another artist friend recently, and um, and he said, you know what, you know what, you have that might be unique. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you don't really fit um, in necessarily the you know the more modern and contemporary world, and you're not really totally you know in the traditional world. You kind of have your feet dipping in both sides and and that that can appeal to you know uh, he was saying it can appeal to a broad range of of collectors i think that that's 100 percent true and yeah. and working in the plein air east end galleries over that weekend for, for years i've certainly heard people say that about your work i think it does appeal to a lot of people because of that i think some of the the realism that comes comes forth in in um, some of the plein air paintings, like really does not resonate with people, and if it gets too out there, it doesn't either. Yeah, so I, I mean that could be, it. but uh, but as I said before, I'm I'm just kind of painting what comes naturally to me, um, and I, I guess I don't fit into a particular box or style. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, 
you know, it's always, I mean, I, I sell concerts for a living, so it, it's always tough to find, you know, how are you going to tell people what yeah. the style is, of the you band know, is like? You know, it's jazz, but also Americana, <laughs> but also rock and roll, fusion. <laughs> Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I wasn't trying to put anybody no. in a box. <laughs> no. It's just... Uh, I, you know, I think I think ultimately all of my paintings have hopefully a consistency of mood. Um, and, and hopefully the viewer is deriving some sort of an emotional feeling from what they're so seeing. So how often when you're painting in plein air, because I know you've been doing a lot of studio work and I want to make sure that we talk about that, how much of the mood that is captured in the painting is your personal mood versus the mood of the day? Or does it just totally depend? No, I think when I'm painting on site, um, then it's definitely has more to do with the not my personal mood that I'm bringing to to um, bringing to it, but it's more um, the mood what of the I'm, day. The mood of the day, yes, yeah, yeah, and that's what I'm painting now. When I'm in the studio, it can be more my personal mood put into when I'm creating. One thing that you mentioned to me earlier was about when you are on site and you're thinking about design. Y- you're looking at a scene, but you are sort of reconstructing it in your head. Is yes. that what you yeah. said? Yeah. You know, I think um, in, in initially when I first started painting, yeah. I I would paint uh, on site. And if the tree was on the left and the bush was on the right, then that's what, how I would paint it. And, that's, and I was learning by painting it that way. And I think as I matured, um, I... I'm now moving objects or trees around to create a design so that the overall design of the painting is will work. Um, what, what, how, why would you lay them out different? I mean, other than you like it. Yeah, there's certain design principles that um, for it needs to lead the eye this way. Yeah, leading the eye, having a, a focal point or a pathway for the eye to. To What's follow. one of those a simple tip that you could give for um, me? Say. Okay, yeah, um, diagonals are always great. So and having a focal point for the eye to lead to is is, is wonderful. I have um, no idea what you're talking about. Okay, so <laughs> okay, you don't have to keep your diagonals. Explain. It's just yeah. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. eye, you know, if you had all horizontal flat lines, uh, it can be restful. But it may not be that interesting to the viewer. Mm -hmm. Um, When you add some diagonals, it causes the eye to follow the diagonals to, you know, and, and and it's more interesting to the viewer. And you want to try and keep the viewer within the painting as well. So if there's exit spots where, where you, um, as an artist, you know that the viewer's eye is going to just travel right Move off along. the painting mm-hmm. into maybe to the next painting next door. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You don't want to do that. So, you know, you want to, you want to try and capture the audience, so to speak, with, with how you're creating your painting. How do those, how do those, how did you learn those principles? Does that go back to urban like urban development or is that yeah, from yeah. from the classes that you've taken in more modern time from reading like because that's pretty that's pretty specific specific that actually is your sociology degree in there too <laughs> <laughs> you can rest assured you're still using that those classes i guarantee you i'm a sociology minor i'm shocked at how often i'm like this is totally sociology <laughs> yeah now um uh, I, I think that, uh, that it comes from just l- learning from other artists. I try. I'm a sponge. I mean, I I really want to know as much as I possibly can so drive all again. the time. I mean, I'm reading magazines. I'm um, when I say reading magazines, it means uh, a lot of times I'm looking at the paintings and the magazines, <laughs> <laughs> studying them. Yeah, sure, studying them. Um, just as much as I can get my hands on, and information-wise, I've taken great workshops with artists that I respect and admire. Um, talking to other artists, um, never stop learning. Yeah, never stop learning. There's some great books out there to to um, to you know to if you're just starting out that that are are great references. And while you still are painting outside and participating in a lot of great competitions, you were telling me that you're having a lot of fun in your studio right now. I am. Yeah. Tell me about that. Tell me what the heck you're doing in your studio. <laughs> What's going on? Well, uh, I for for the time being, I have not been using photo reference um, nor um, anything else. I I've just been um, I. 
you know, I'm. This is what I say to people. I'm. I'm really horrible at math, <laughs> but uh, but I'm good at remembering uh, the vi- the landscape outside and and how I felt about that landscape, and I almost consider it to be when I'm in the studio like a sift. I'm a sifter, so I'm sifting out the the what I call the extra material or stuff that I don't need in my painting and I'm remembering the emotional quality that I felt when I was out plein air painting of a particular scene and so I can visualize that and lay it out on the canvas from from my memory and um, and I, uh, I, I, I really was that di- obviously different from a photograph is that a riskier there's no risk. It's kind I mean, of a that, mental. Yeah. It's a mental photograph, yeah. and yeah. in some ways, it's not risky because nobody's saying, "Oh, that tree should be on the left," yeah. right? No. Like it's more. Yeah, and the, and that's that's what I want to get across so to people it's too. It's growth. It's growth. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And um, I, I, when I walk into my studio, I think of it like walking into a scientist might walk into a laboratory. It's well, it's it's a place to um, to push things. Yes, I do have deadlines and I do have commitments and and. Um, and I, you know, I fulfill. Well, those and scientists but, do too. <laughs> and scientists do too. That's right. But but it's also, I mean, growth comes from exploration. So I encourage um, artists that are just beginning to um, to try different ways of doing things. I mean, it's not necessary to always, you know, I don't always do anything. I don't always tone my canvas this color and then I start painting. I don't always, you know, draw in. I try to do things differently all the time, and 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 I think it increases failure, but it also increases um, uh, opportunities for seeing things that you that I never thought I would discover. It's like, oh my gosh, you know. It's- I love this notion that you're not painting from any photo reference, but you said that you are still evoking a place in the proportions of those. That, that place like when you're saying you're not good at math but you remember to me I'm like okay but you remember the space yes yeah. not the math of that yeah. space but th- are they real spaces like are you evoking a certain place you're saying oh I remember my chi- the childhood beach in Maine or whatever like what is what do you what, what is it or is it just total fantasy or both I think I, I would say it's a little bit of both and probably more real spaces um um and uh, you're thinking about a place you've been. You're remembering the shapes and volume of that space and, and color and mood and trying to translate right. that onto the canvas. But oftentimes, and this sounds a little odd maybe, but oftentimes I don't know what I'm going to paint. I'll walk in, and even with a larger canvas, um, I'm not sure where I'm, what I'm going to do. But I take paint and just start applying it. And the place and then, comes. I, and then I might flip it. I might flip the canvas. So it's really starting in a very, very abstract way. Um, and, and then I'll, it starts reminding you of a space. It reminds me of something. <laughs> oh, this yes, totally looks yes. like Ocean City yeah. or something. And then they'll start laying that in and um, and maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then I might flip it again and start again and so try cool. something different. You know, it's and tell everybody how big these canvases are now, because they're getting really big. Well, uh, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> the largest is uh, now. I'm working on a sixty by seventy-two. So that's that's awesome. us. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's a traveling issue, but uh, ship, <laughs> shipping issue. But yeah, it's, uh, it's fun. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it's going to work out. And I guess just a couple more questions, uh, Joe. I wanted to ask when you go in, because I've noticed this um, it, it just it, it being around you in the competitions. When you say, when I walk into the studio, I'm going to work and I'm go- I've got things to do, whatever. Do you get into a different mindset? Because um, it... You mean during a competition? Just or? Whenever you're painting, generally. Because right now, you're, obvi- you're very lovely and you're having a great conversation. But I've seen you in when you're painting. Uh-huh. And it's, you know... There's not really a whole lot of talking oh, when, going on. Okay, when you're saying a different mindset. She's still mindset. lovely. She's just focused. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's right. You know what I call that? I call that being in the zone, and it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, I think, and I think art, other artists would agree that um, there are certain times where absolutely time stands still, and I'm sure you may have experienced this when you're in depth working on something where you're not realizing time is going by, and, and you're, you know, so my... Yes, I, I absolutely have, but it doesn't happen all the time. Um, but when it does, it's fantastic. And then I, I'm done painting, and I look at that painting, and I'm like, who, who painted that? <laughs> I didn't paint that. <laughs> so, That's yes, great. it does happen, but 
not so often. <laughs> gotcha. I think that I, I've, I've asked a lot of people, you know, like, why are you making this art? Like, mm -hmm. what, what is this? Like, who is it for? Like, you, are you painting, again, are you painting to win? Are you painting to sell? Like, what is making you do this? Right. Yeah. It, there's like I, a calling to put it, there's like a calling to put it out there, or I, like a drive I'll to, you, to want to do it. It's feeding you back. It's doing, there's some relationship there. And I don't think everybody has that. I don't really believe that everybody's an artist. Well, I don't, I don't. I, well, I'm not sure, but I'm not even sure if it's the same conversation. But my thing was, is like, when I, when I started doing this and I tell, because I hear from actors all the time that they're like oh I, I want to I love for the applause I, I, I want to get people cheering when I started doing when I started studying acting like 25 years ago my I had no interest in getting an applause none I, I could care less mm -hmm. we we were we would get up and like give the audience the finger you know what I mean like we didn't care about <laughs> applause what I wanted to know was what did a person have to do to become good at it like, just like Jill, though, she's I like, don't know if that's what she... She doesn't really care about that. I wanted to... Like, when they said Harrison Ford was a good actor, I was like, I don't really understand why they're saying it, but I want to figure out why they're saying it. And that's what drove me to keep studying it and to keep doing it versus... The, the applause style thing. But you know that's what I mean? she was saying. Don't do it for other people. But she's like, I'm a sponge. All I wanted to do was like soak up the more information about how to grow my craft and like be better and learn the edges and, you know, try new things and like push and grow. Like, I mean, do you want to be good at it though? Or, I mean, I know you, you can say you don't want to sell it. You can talk about all that kind of stuff and that's all fine. We don't have to mm -hmm. get into that. But like, do you want to be good at it? Uh, you know, it's, it's a constant line of learning. I mean, I will never stop learning. I'll never be good at it because there's always another level to go. And I, it's, it, that's one of the ultimate frustrations. Of Did you ever a, suck at it? An artist. <laughs> you never, you, uh, I mean, I know that I'm better at yes, an actor Yes, I suck now. at it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm the first one to tell myself that I suck at it. Me too. Me too. I'm the same way. No, no, and it's and it's. See, this is the part that's terrifying. <laughs> I want to be perfect right out of the gate. And, it, well, and that's yeah, it's proven that I suck at it a lot because I have stacks of failed paintings, you know, and and I don't think any. We'd like to go person. take a look at those. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no successful person, no matter what they're doing, hasn't had their share of failures in the, in the process. You have to fail in order to succeed you can't not fail <laughs> well i guess then the next question is for you guys for you would be uh, is the, if you wanted to be good at it you know and you put in your entries to the competition and then you don't win mm -hmm. uh, that, that there's in, in easton's case there's 116 paintings uh, that mm -hmm. you're going up against so the odds of your one are really low but what does you know you put in a good painting. I know I did a good job. Mm -hmm. How does it how does I it come I think there's up? a certain sense of personal satisfaction with that. And then it goes into how do the collectors respond? I mean, and oftentimes um, some of my, what I would consider my better work um, maybe does not get an award, um, but will sell or or the opposite way around. It, you know, um, uh, it, might, it might get an award or, right. or it might go unnoticed. And I just think I've come across this great new way of doing something, you know, sure. but yet it's not, you know, it's not getting noticed. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think one of the last persons we talked to uh, was, uh, you know, saying don't be afraid to join the competitions because, you know, you're always being judged. Yeah. You know, you're yeah. always like well, so whatever you put out. You know what I mean? It, you know, maybe because I'm I'm starting this the, my art career later, um, I realize that I only have so much time in life, and I'm gonna. What's to be afraid of? I don't want to have regrets when I'm old and say, well, I, I should have tried this or I should have done this, you know. No, you know, now's the time to do it. And then what's the worst that can happen? You know, that's what I always think. Just do it. <laughs> As Nike says. <laughs> I love it. Maybe we should hit them up for sponsorship. <laughs> Is there anything else that you want to add, Joe? No, I just think we didn't talk I, about. We didn't talk about. Um, no, I, I just want to encourage artists um, to really not be afraid to 
try stuff and also not to follow a particular formula that they might be missing out on on certain opportunities for growth if if they don't try other ways of of seeing and doing. No, I think that was something that you mentioned to me earlier and I'll, I'll bring it back to competition because that's where my most of my mm-hmm. art experience is. You know, you said don't don't paint for the judge, paint for yourself. Don't paint for the people around you. And and I have certainly seen that in terms of artists who have um, done really well both from a sales and award standpoint like when you're feeling when you're in the zone when you're feeling empowered when you're really loving what you're painting you actually do perform better overall and if you're painting the thing that you think that is going to sell like it you, you can tell when the heart isn't there or, or if you're painting something that sold last year that you painted and you go back there to repaint it it does not have the same like heart or soul to it and I think that artists can fall into that trap because it is their livelihood and they do want to make sure that they're that there's a return on their investment of being here but I think that really following your path and using competitions to push those boundaries and to explore new things in new places Mm -hmm. you know that is where you could get looser than you've ever been or smaller than you've ever painted or bigger than you've ever painted or faster you know I think that you know it is sort of about finding your next thing and I think that competitions allow you to do force you sometimes yes yes yes. to get out of your comfort zone and do that yeah, and I think also, you know, for those those artists that are traveling from out of town and coming to maybe a landscape that they're not familiar with. The color palette. They, they, they're yeah, not the color with. palette, the landscape is different. Um, it can be overwhelming, and perhaps they're thinking, well, I, I won't know how to, how to do this. But in fact, I've found that when I'm traveling and painting others' areas that I have never been before it's so eye opening um, and and I think that those paintings that those artists are creating that aren't from the area um, have such f- a fresh vision and um, so I think that's kind of cool too because to they're not staring at it every day no that's, <laughs> that's one thing I love about Plenary East and it reminds me about what a beautiful place yes, that we live in when, when, when we're just when I'm just driving to try to get to the <laughs> hockey rink over and over again those beautiful fields just right. go right right by yeah. me uh, it's been I mean I've gone to other events where I've just been in an awe and um, say in Texas sure and, and uh, someone will drive on me and they'll say in their Texas accent, well, what are you painting? <laughs> like, and I, in my mind, I'm saying, don't you see? Right. Uh, oh, my. I, I've never seen anything quite so beautiful or unique. And they don't see it. So it's. I think that as artists, that's our job. Our job is to translate what we're our vision um, and express express it to others. Jill, it's been so fun talking to you today. <laughs> I feel like we could talk to her for another five yeah, hours. We'll probably have, we'll have to have you back. <laughs> oh, okay. We'll talk about new new big things that you're working on. Oh, literally, oh. wait, literally big things she's working on. <laughs> I knew you'd be a great guest, Jill. I'm, oh. I'm, I'm, I mean, it's cool to have somebody actually in the studio too, which is yeah. nice. I well, know we're lucky to have Jill in our community. We can see her and talk to her all the time. Oh, right. Well, thank you right. for having me. It was an honor. Awesome. <laughs> thanks for coming, Jill. It's great. All right. Thanks. The Plein Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation and was produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions with additional episode music by David Hillowitz. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plein Air Easton at pleinairisten.com.